we continue with who was George Washington Carver. Today we start at Chapter 5, The Greatest Good. George had no plans to leave Iowa State. He liked the faculty and the students there, and they liked him. He was studying for a graduate degree in agriculture and was teaching young men and women too. It looked as if George was set for a long career at the school, but in April 1896, he received a letter that changed his life. It was from educator and orator Booker T. Washington. Washington was perhaps the most famous black man in America in the late 1800s. In 1895, he gave a speech at the Cotton States and International Exposition in Atlanta, Georgia. The speech has come to be called the Atlanta Compromise. Washington essentially urged blacks to accept the idea of separate but equal in exchange for education, job training, and fairness in the court system. He wanted blacks to work with whites, not against them, to fight racism. Not everyone agreed with Booker T. Washington. Some of his critics in the civil rights movement felt that accepting separate but equal meant whites would always think blacks were not as good as they were. Booker T. Washington, of course, didn't believe that, but he believed that if blacks ever were to achieve true equality in the United States, they would need better education. That was why Booker jumped at the chance to start an all-black school in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1881. The Tuskegee Institute opened in a run-down one-room building that year with just $2,000 from the state of Alabama. The next year, the school purchased 100 acres of land and the campus began to develop. Booker T. Washington, 1856 to 1915. Booker Talia Farrow Washington was born into slavery. He grew up to become an educator, an author, and a well-known speaker. In 1881, he established the Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, because he felt that education was the best path for black people to achieve true equality. In his time, Washington was the most famous leader of the black community. In 1901, he became the first black person to be officially invited to the White House when President Theodore Roosevelt asked him to dinner. The Tuskegee Institute Tuskegee wasn't a traditional college like Iowa State that accepted only high school graduates. Instead, some Tuskegee students had as little as a fifth grade education. Many of their parents and grandparents had been slaves. They were there for hands-on learning they could use in their day-to-day -day lives. As part of their classes, some early Tuskegee students actually built the classrooms that rose on the new campus. Booker was still the president of the Tuskegee Institute when he wrote to George in 1896. The school was growing, Booker explained. He wanted to add a Department of Agriculture and he wanted George to be in charge of it. George had read about Booker's big Atlanta speech in the newspapers. George's beliefs about race relations were much the same as Booker's. George had lived among and worked with whites all his life. He believed that working with whites was the best path to equality, and of course, George recognized the value of an education. So that was why George, even though he was perfectly happy at Iowa State, thought long and hard about Booker's offer. Tuskegee couldn't pay George as much money and didn't have the modern buildings or equipment. He would be leaving the comfort and security of one job for the uncertainty of another. But the one great ideal of my life is to be of the greatest good to the greatest number of my people, George wrote to Booker. So he accepted the job, finished up his graduate degree at Iowa State, and arrived in Tuskegee in October 1896. Chapter 6, Tuskegee. The city of Tuskegee and the surrounding area turned out to be an amazing place. George found many new plants and flowers to study. The school itself, however, wasn't so amazing. When George arrived, he had no rooms in which to store his collections and not even a laboratory in which to work. But George didn't worry about what he didn't have. Use what you find around you, he told his first students. He took them to a junkyard. They dug up old pots and pans, saucers and spoons, boxes and string, whatever they could find, and made their own laboratory. It was all part of hands-on learning for George's students. He didn't want to just stand in front of a classroom and give lectures. He wanted his students to touch and feel nature and to think. Chapter 7, 
On early morning walks, George collected samples of soil or flowers or insects that he shared in his classroom. Outside the classroom, he set up a practice farm on 10 acres of land. It was an experiment station. One acre was for testing the soil, another was for growing sweet potatoes, another for studying fertilizers, and so on. With the experiment station, George took his wish to be the greatest good to the greatest number seriously. He invited local farmers to come to the school once a month to learn about the soil. During their monthly meetings, George analyzed the farmer's soil and gave them samples of his. Then he started encouraging them to come in between the monthly meetings whenever they needed some help. Then he invited the wives to come along too. He showed them ways to plan meals and prepare food and he discussed the value of different foods. George didn't have the money for fancy equipment at Tuskegee, so his advice was helpful to the farmers who didn't have the money for fancy equipment either. George wanted farmers to pay attention to nature and all it had to offer. He wrote different booklets that taught how to grow tomatoes or raise hogs or preserve meat. The more farmers could do on their own, the less they had to spend at the market and the less they had to go without. Anything that fills the dinner pail is valuable, he said. He wrote other booklets to help farmers improve the appearance of their land and their homes. He knew they couldn't afford to buy paint, but he also knew there were plenty of natural resources. Different types of natural clay, for instance, could be mixed and make different colors for paint. With a little glue mixed in, it would stick to cabin walls. George also taught farmers how to care for native plants, flowers, and grasses and how to fix up their homes. Such a work schedule, though, was exhausting. George liked to get up by 4 o'clock in the morning and walk in the woods. Then he taught four or five classes each day. He also ran the experiment station and worked in the homemade laboratory. He continued to paint and draw too, and he often wrote letters to Moses and Susan Carver and to the other families he had lived with. He also organized a Bible study class once a week. His intense workload and many interests left George little time for fun. Sometimes his friends set him up on dates, but he never married. In 1906, George designed the Jessup Agricultural Wagon. It was a movable classroom and portable laboratory. The Jessup Wagon was named for a New York banker, Morris K. Jessup who helped pay for it. A former student of George's was in charge of taking the wagon to faraway farmers who couldn't make it to Tuskegee. The wagon was loaded with soil, seeds, booklets, and other study materials. In 1908, George had the chance to visit Moses, who had moved to Kansas after Susan's death several years earlier. It would be the last time George saw his foster father. Moses Carver died in his late 90s in 1910. Five years after losing his father, George also lost his friend, Booker T. Washington. Booker was 59 when he died of heart failure in 1915. George and Booker didn't always agree on how things should be run at Tuskegee, but they were close friends. I am sure Mr. Washington never knew how much I loved him and the cause for which he gave his life, George wrote another friend. Booker T. Washington had been the face of the Tuskegee Institute since the school opened its doors. After his death, Robert Russa Moton became president of Tuskegee, but it was George who became the most famous person at the school. Chapter 7, Peanuts. While at Tuskegee, George liked to tell a story about a talk he had once had with God. Mr. Creator, why did you make the universe? George asked. Little man, that question is too big for you, God answered. Try another. So George asked, Mr. Creator, why did you make man? God answered, little man, that question is still too big for you. Try another. This time, George asked, Mr. Creator, why did you make the peanut? And God said, little man, that question is just your size. You listen and I will teach you. Apparently, George was a good listener because while experimenting at Tuskegee, he began to develop more than 300 products that could be made from the peanut. They included everything from peanut milk to peanut punch, plastics, glue, soaps, and dyes. Peanuts were considered so lowly that before George began to study them, they were mostly used for animal food. Farmers couldn't make much money from peanuts and had little reason to grow them. Cotton had been the main crop in the American South, but in the early 1900s, it cost some farmers more to grow cotton than they could sell it for. The boll weevil, a type of beetle that feeds on cotton buds and can destroy entire crops, came to the United States from Mexico in the late 1800s. By 1910, it had arrived in Alabama. 
After many years of studying soil, George knew that planting cotton over and over again sucked the nutrients substances plants need to grow out of the soil. He wanted farmers to rotate their crops. That meant growing cotton one season but switching to a different crop the next. Then they could replant cotton the season after that. One of the crops George recommended for cotton growers was the sweet potato. Sweet potato plants were easy to grow and crops could be stored during the winter months. They were good for the soil and they could be eaten many different ways. Some of George's earliest bulletins were on the sweet potato. George also experimented with cowpeas, sugar beets, rice, soybeans, alfalfa, and more. His experiments helped him understand the best ways to grow these crops so that they would yield the most food. He learned what kinds of soil and growing conditions they needed. In 1910, Tuskegee built George a modern laboratory to replace his homemade one. And by 1915, his experiments were taking so much of his time that he began to give up teaching. In 1916, George wrote his most famous booklet, How to Grow the Peanut and 105 Ways of Preparing It for Human Consumption. Recipes included items such as peanut soup, peanut bread, and peanut pudding. Several recipes included peanut butter in them. Peanut butter was number 51, peanut butter candy was number 70, and peanut butter fudge was number 80. In fact, George wrote so much about peanuts that he is sometimes mistakenly credited with, credited with inventing peanut butter. The same year George produced his famous peanut booklet, he was honored by the Royal Society of Arts in London. The Royal Society honors people in science and art who find practical solutions to problems. That summed up George perfectly. At the time, it was rare for an American to be honored, let alone one who had been born into slavery. Around the same time, George was reportedly offered a job to work for American inventor Thomas Edison in his New Jersey laboratory. George could have become rich working for Edison, but he was so devoted to helping the farmers in the South, so he stayed at Tuskegee. The Peanut Journal wrote that George Washington Carver is to the peanut industry what Thomas Edison is to electricity. One biographer even called George the patron saint of the peanut industry. Peanut butter. Most historians believe peanut butter has been around for hundreds of years. Both the Inca civilization in South America and the Aztecs of ancient Mexico ground peanuts into paste. In the United States, Dr. John Henry Kellogg, famous for Kellogg cereals, believed that peanut butter was a very healthy food. He made his own type of peanut butter in 1895. Peanut butter really became popular among the American public at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, along with the ice cream cone and cotton candy. Thomas Edison, 1847 to 1931. Thomas Alva Edison was an inventor who changed the world. He invented hundreds of items, including some that had a great influence on everyday life, such as the first practical light bulb, the phonograph, and the motion picture camera. Edison was known for working tirelessly at his laboratories in Menlo Park, New Jersey. His nickname was the Wizard of Menlo Park. He famously said, genius is the 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And next time we will read chapter 8, Lasting Impact.